All right, what's going on, everyone? We got an Afghanistan update today. It's going to hit a little bit on Pakistan as well. Uh, some bombings all across the country, as well as the first public execution since the Taliban came to power a little over a year ago. Now, the reason I've been getting into these Afghanistan updates is because I'm interested in it. I don't think, as we sit here today, that Afghanistan is as important to the United States national security as what's going on in Ukraine or China or even some of the conflicts in the Middle East, like Syria, Turkey, Yemen. I'm not looking at Afghanistan in some strategic sense of, you know, we might go there at some point or have to go back there at some point, like folks might study China or North Korea, for instance. This is more of just, you know, we spent a lot of time a lot of money and a lot of lives in and around that country. And I'm interested in how it looks going forward. Where does it get better? Does it get better? You know, what does Afghanistan look like moving into the future? All right, we're starting out our Afghanistan update talking about Pakistan. There's just a lot of overlap there, especially in the border region, of course, between the Pakistani Taliban, TTP, and then the Afghan Taliban that we're probably more familiar with that are in control in Kabul and in Afghanistan. But looking back on November 28th, the Pakistani Taliban ended a month-long ceasefire with the Pakistani government and ordered its fighters to resume attacks across the country. Now, while the ceasefire was technically in effect, the TTP didn't really stop their attacks over the last few months, and we'll get into some of those shortly. Now, in a statement, the Pakistani Taliban said that they were moving away from that ceasefire because the Pakistani government had continued to target their leadership and forces all across that border area with Afghanistan. Staying with Pakistan here to talk about one of those attacks. On November 30th, a suicide bomber blew himself up near a truck carrying police officers that were on their way to protect and kind of oversee polio workers near Quetta. That attack killed one police officer as well as three additional bystanders and wounded 23, most of whom were police officers. You can see here the bus flipped down into the ditch with how powerful that explosion was. Now, I've read some statements about how the Taliban are very opposed to like vaccination efforts carried out by international organizations and how they have certain fears about what actually might be going on rather than just, you know, in this case, a vaccination against polio. But the accounts of those or the statements that I've seen on that kind of theory is pretty thin, so I'm not going to go with that. Instead, a lot of these TTP attacks over the course of the last couple of years, really, have been targeted towards security forces, military, or in this case, police. So I'm not sure if this group was targeted just because they were policemen, which would fit past models, or if it has something to do with the mission that they were on of supporting this polio vaccination. But either way, a day or two after that happened, the Pakistan government demanded that the Afghan Taliban kind of rein in their Pakistan arm that, again, looks like carried out this attack. Pakistan's interior minister, Khan, said that if the TTP is behind that attack, then, quote, it should be a matter of concern for the Taliban. By that, he means the Afghan Taliban. Now, there actually are statements coming out from the Taliban. Remember, that's the official government in Afghanistan now. So when they were presented with this information, a spokesperson for the Taliban said, quote, we once again assure all the countries of the region and the world that Afghanistan soil will never be used against other countries. That very well might be the Taliban's goal and desire. It makes sense. I'm not sure they have the ability to enforce that right now. I mean, just days and weeks after the Taliban took over back in 2021, there were known Al-Qaeda members flowing back into Afghanistan. And now we've got more and more attacks being carried out by the TTP against Pakistan. Those are very different groups. And the Afghan Taliban would certainly hold more sway with the TTP than they do with Al-Qaeda. But I don't think the Afghan Taliban want to be seen as housing forces that carry out attacks against the international community or around the world. Realistically, they've got a lot on their hands just governing inside of their borders. And if you look back to 9-11 and the years leading up to it, having Al-Qaeda in their country put a real kink in the Taliban's plans. I'm not sure they're willingly trying to open that door back up again. It just might be a matter of whether or not they can keep it closed. Continuing on, on November 30th, a bomb was detonated in a religious school in northern Afghanistan, killing at least 10, according to a Taliban official. A document from a local authority said that 16 were killed and 22 were wounded. I've also come across some estimates just in different reporting channels 
that put the death toll closer to 20. But either way, there was no confirmed suspect right away from this attack. A lot of signs pointed to the Islamic State. They've just really picked up violence over the last couple months in Afghanistan. However, as of late, the National Liberation Front of Afghanistan has allegedly claimed responsibility, saying that the school was used by Taliban forces as a military base and the targets were members of the Taliban. However, that kind of contrasts with other information that's coming out, including statements from the United Nations that said some of those killed in the attack were children. If you remember from last week, the National Liberation Front is this kind of successor to the Northern Alliance that fought the Taliban back pre-9-11. They're holding out against the Taliban in certain parts of the country, but I think this is just a reminder that things are probably going to be messy over there for quite a while. Sticking with the Islamic State here, on December 2nd, they claim responsibility for an attack on the Pakistani embassy in Afghanistan. It was a small arms attack. One guard was wounded. And the Islamic State came out pretty quick claiming it, saying that two of its fighters attacked, quote, the renegade Pakistani ambassador and his guards. As a result of that, a couple days later, the Taliban said they had arrested a member of the Islamic State that was responsible for that shooting. They said the suspect was a foreign national, so not an Afghan, and that he carried out the attack that was organized jointly by the Islamic State and rebels. Now, rebels is a term the Taliban have used to describe like really anybody who pushes back against their power and their authority. So they've used it a lot to talk about the National Resistance Front. But in this case, they're actually talking about something entirely different. The Taliban spokesperson continued by saying, quote, some foreign circles are behind the attack and the aim was to create distrust between the two brotherly countries, Afghanistan and Pakistan. So it's not clear like who exactly they're blaming from this but it sounds like they're accusing either a foreign government or another non-state actor of lining up with the Islamic State to try to sow distrust between Pakistan and Afghanistan. I'm not sure that I'm totally on board with that. It's not crazy that the Islamic State fighter was a foreign national, not an Afghan. That checks out, but they're just carrying out so many attacks as of late. I'm not sure that there's some grand master scheme with foreign governments to carry out small arms harassing fire against foreign diplomats in Afghanistan. Could be. I don't know. It just kind of seems like a small event with a big claim. Also on December 2nd, there was reports that at least two suicide bombers tried to kill Gulbuddin Hekmatar. That's a name that people might recognize from uh, the last 30, 40 years in Afghanistan. Uh, he's got quite the history, really. He was one of the Mujahideen leaders they received a lot of funding from the CIA when they were fighting the Soviets back in the 1980s. When that war came to a close, he got involved in the heroin and opium business for a while. He was the prime minister of Afghanistan briefly before the Taliban took power. And then when U.S. and NATO forces were in Afghanistan, he was uh, not on the same page that we were. That we were. So he was responsible for funding and resourcing a lot of groups that attacked American, NATO, and Afghan forces for 15 or so years before finally coming to some sort of negotiation where he was pardoned and came back into Afghanistan in 2017. It was part of this process to try to find an end of the war, to try to find a peace deal. Hekmatar is not technically Taliban. He's not a member of the Taliban that I'm aware of. He's certainly not in any Taliban inner circles, but he is a power broker in Afghanistan. And when he came back, or when the Taliban takeover was happening in 2021, he signaled that he supported it, but he wasn't necessarily going to be joining the Taliban. I believe that same situation holds today. I'm not sure that he holds any um, formal positions of power in Afghanistan. All of that to say, I don't see a good reason for the Taliban to necessarily want to kill Hekmatar at this point. When you hear suicide bombers, my mind immediately shifts to Islamic State. They've just, it's one of their very well-known and regularly used tactics. But as of now, December 8th, nobody has claimed responsibility for this supposed assassination attempt. Then on December 6th, an IED was detonated next to a full bus in Mazari Sharif that killed six people and wounded seven, according to a Taliban official. The IED was hidden in a cart by the side of the road and detonated 
when the bus passed by, it was full of employees, they were taken to work. It's not clear from the information that's come out because there's been very, very little if that bus or those workers were the specific target or if this was more just generally sowing chaos in the area. That same day, December 6th, another six people were wounded when a bomb went off in Jalalabad. Nobody's claimed responsibility for either one of these two attacks, but again, a lot of the focus as of late, just because of their increase in activity, has been on the Islamic State Khorasan province. Finally, on December 7th, Taliban authorities executed an Afghan convicted of killing another man. And this is the first public execution since the Taliban took over in August of 2021. We talked about this a little bit last week. It hadn't happened yet, but it looked like this might be the direction the Taliban were headed. There were thoughts when they took over that these public executions, public punishments might not make their way back into Afghanistan just there were more eyes on the country, and they it seemed like they were really trying to make their way into the international community in some senses. But this does look an awful lot like what was happening uh, pre-9-11. So the way the execution played out was the victim's father shot the suspect with an assault rifle in front of what was quoted as hundreds of spectators and many top Taliban officials. The executed man's name was Tamir. He's from Herat province. He was convicted of killing a gentleman named Mustafa, stealing his motorcycle and mobile phone five years ago. So, I mean, we're talking 2016, 17 time frame, maybe. The Afghan government was still in control of the country on paper. There were certainly areas that the Taliban had more sway. But throughout, you know, over the last 20 years, the Taliban have had these shadow courts, shadow governments set up all over the country. A lot of times these shadow governments were set up when the national Afghan government didn't have the reach or the personnel to actually get out to some of these more remote regions and settle disputes, you know, something as simple as that. So the Taliban would step in and take advantage of that void. It's possible that this is a case, a five-year-old case. They might have brought this to the Taliban five years ago, and it's been on their docket, right? It's a case that they are working through and just now came to a decision. I mean, this type of justice isn't new. It's something the Taliban's been doing for a long time. Even when they weren't in power, you would see, um, you know, not public displays like we're seeing here, but the Taliban was making decisions all over the country at the local level for the last 20 years. Now it's just kind of front and center and making the international news. All right, that's all I got for Afghanistan updates for now. I'll see you next time.